In our last video, we talked about the states of short-run equilibrium that a country's economy could experience. We showed in ADAS graphs what positive output gaps and what negative output gaps look like. In this video, we're going to actually step back a little bit and talk about the factors that could cause positive and negative output gaps to occur in a country. The term we're going to be talking about in this video is shocks to aggregate demand and aggregate supply. We're going to use some graphs to illustrate both positive and negative demand and supply shocks and talk about how a country's economy will adjust in the short run to a new equilibrium following a shock to either AD or AS. Let's start with the definition of demand shocks. We'll actually define positive demand shocks first and then we'll show the effect that a positive demand shock would have on a country's economy. A positive demand shock occurs anytime there is an increase in AD resulting from an increase in either consumption, investment, government spending, or net exports. If aggregate demand increases due to an increase in one of the different national expenditures, we can show the effect that this will have in the short run in our ADAS graph. So let's assume that due to an increase in household wealth as a result of rising home prices, households decide to consume more goods and services at every price level. This causes an increase in aggregate demand to AD1. Now, let's look at the effect that this would have on the nation's economy, assuming there is no change in the price level, and then assuming the price level adjusts to the new level of aggregate demand. This will look quite familiar to any student who has already studied microeconomics and knows that if demand for a particular good increases and there is no corresponding increase in the price of that good, then we will have what's called a disequilibrium in the short run. And the same is true on a macroeconomic level. If aggregate demand, due to increased household wealth and consumption, and there is no increase in prices, there will be a quantity of output demanded that is greater than the quantity of output supplied. So here we have a disequilibrium. There will be a shortage, this would be a shortage, of goods and services in the United States if aggregate demand increases and there is no corresponding increase in the price level. So just like in microeconomics, if there is a disequilibrium in a market, that market must adjust in the form of rising prices in this case. So demand pull inflation will result from a positive demand shock. Demand pull inflation is a rise in the price level resulting from an increase in aggregate demand. Here we can see that here. We have a new equilibrium price level of PL2. The higher price level of goods and services incentivizes businesses to increase the quantity of output that they produce, and it reduces the quantity of output demanded by households who previously had increased the amount of output they demanded due to rising wealth, and we achieve a new equilibrium, I'll call this YE1, a new equilibrium at the intersection of SRAS and aggregate demand. In the short run, an increase in aggregate demand will cause an increase in output beyond full employment, and an increase in the average price level. This is called demand pull inflation. And an increase in the quantity of output demanded and supplied in the economy. A positive demand shock occurs when aggregate demand increases. That, of course, means that a negative demand shock, when there is a decrease in AD, resulting from a decrease in consumption, investment, government spending, or net exports. Let's assume, for example, that interest rates rise in the economy, leading firms to demand less new capital equipment and technology, causing a decrease in private sector investment. Falling investment means that at every price level, there will be a smaller quantity of goods and services demanded by the nation's firms and households. So what happens if the price level remains at the original price level of PLE? Well, there would be, once again, a disequilibrium. The quantity of output demanded, I'll call that YD, would be less than the quantity of output supplied, resulting in a surplus of goods and services produced in this country. To restore equilibrium, the equilibrium price level must fall, leading to an increase in the quantity of output demanded by households and firms and the government and foreigners, and a decrease in the quantity of output supplied by the nation's producers. As the price level falls, we're going to see a new equilibrium at PL2, and a new equilibrium level of output at YE1. A negative demand shock causes what we call deflation. This is a fall in the average price level. 
or depending on the level of inflation at full employment, this might just be a fall in the inflation rate, which is known as disinflation. In other words, if inflation is still positive, but it's just lower than it was while the economy is at full employment, then we don't see prices actually fall. We just see lower rates of inflation. A negative demand shock causes a decrease in output, a decrease in the price level, and a new equilibrium level of national output below the original equilibrium. And of course, this economy now has a recessionary gap. We talked about recessionary gaps in the previous video. So recessionary gaps can be caused by negative demand shock. Inflationary gaps can be caused by a positive demand shock. All right, let's move on and talk about aggregate supply shocks. This time we're going to start with negative aggregate supply shocks. A negative aggregate supply shock occurs whenever there is an increase in the costs of production in a country, which causes a decrease in short-run aggregate supply. So assume, for example, there's an unexpected increase in energy prices. All businesses, no matter what they're producing, depend on electricity. So if electricity prices go up, we would expect to see an inward shift of the short-run aggregate supply curve as it costs more to produce all goods and services. Now, if the price level were to remain the same at PLE, there would be shortages of goods and services in this country as the quantity of output supplied, I'll call that YS, is less than the quantity of output demanded. This would represent a shortage of goods and services. However, the economy should adjust to a new equilibrium price level and level of national output, and it does so by prices rising. We should see a new equilibrium price level, which causes an increase in the quantity supplied from what would occur at the original price level of PLE, and a decrease in quantity of output demanded, and we achieve a new equilibrium at a higher price level. This is inflation, just like we saw in the positive demand shock section of this video. However, this is not demand pull inflation. This type of inflation is what we call cost push inflation. Cost push inflation results from an increase in the costs of production in a country and a decrease in aggregate supply. This cost push inflation causes a decrease in national output and we have a new equilibrium at YE1. Now we do have a recessionary gap here as well. However, this recessionary gap is not caused by decreasing demand for goods and services, rather decreasing supply. Now, of course, there can be positive supply shocks. Positive supply shock. This would be when aggregate supply increases due to falling costs of production. Assume, for example, that the government enacts a massive policy of deregulation in the United States. Firms can now produce in the cheapest, most environmentally harmful manner imaginable. And as a result, at every price level, firms in the United States wish to produce a greater quantity of output. So we see an increase in short-run aggregate supply to SRAS1. Assume once again that the price level remains at its original level of PLE. If the price level did not fall, following the increase in aggregate supply, we would have a quantity of output supplied, that's YS, that is greater than the quantity of output demanded, we would have surplus output. Just like in microeconomics, if there is a surplus of goods being produced, the price must fall. In macro, the price level must fall. And as it does, households, firms, the government, and foreigners will demand a greater quantity of output and will achieve a new equilibrium. So this is the new equilibrium, call that PL2. Here we see, once again, prices falling. This could be deflation or depending on the rate of inflation before the positive supply shock, it could be disinflation, a lower inflation rate. And as price levels fall, we achieve a new equilibrium level of national output at YE1. All right, we've just walked through four different scenarios. We talked about a positive demand shock, which causes an increase in aggregate demand, leading to demand pull inflation and an increase in the equilibrium level of output. We also talked about a negative demand shock, which causes disinflation or deflation and a decrease in national output, resulting in a recessionary gap. Next, we moved on to supply shocks. A negative supply shock caused by an unexpected increase in the costs of production in a country causes cost push inflation, that's higher prices, and a recessionary gap as the equilibrium output falls in a country. A positive supply shock caused by something like deregulation or any other thing that causes the costs of production in a country to fall, 
causes deflation or disinflation and an increase in the equilibrium level of national output. So an increase in short and aggregate supply is the best of the four scenarios we outlined in this video for a country. It actually means that the country is experiencing economic growth, increased output, and price level stability. In the next video, we're going to talk about long-run adjustments to a country's aggregate output in the ADAS model. Here we go. One step at a time, no.